thank you very much. I'm going to try and give you positive solutions. I'm going to be talking about carbon farming, and in particular in relation to a method for um, carbon capture and storage. And uh, I want to start off, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a kind of global to a local journey. I want to start off on the global um, and talk a little bit about the facts, first of all. The facts um, of the scientific case for climate change is, is, is really clear. I, I, you just can't deny it now. This is the latest report from the, um, the IPPC, and it basically shows that since the Industrial Revolution, we've released 515 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere, and that's um, caused an increase in the global average temperature of 0.85 degrees. Now, we're continuing to release carbon. It's increasing. It's almost exponential. We're on about 10 gigatons of carbon per year now that we're releasing. And um, the trend is, is, is forever upwards, and we're quickly getting towards the IPCC's uh, target of, of 1,000 gigatons, where we hit this two degree temperature rise overall, which is, is widely regarded as a tipping point. Um, now, this is, this is something, as an environmental scientist, this was totally fascinating to me when I first saw it. I, I, fascinating and scary at the same time, because in this I saw potentially a solution in terms of the kind of uh, carbon capture methodology. This is basically the breathing of planet Earth. It's the data from the Northern Hemisphere, it's from Mauna Lua, it, uh, it shows uh, the last few years from 2010 right up until 2014. Uh, this month, we passed a watershed. We went past the 400 pp parts per million in the atmosphere. That's not happened since, humans, since before humans have walked on the planet. It's, it's a really a, a big watershed. But this breathing the planet, the inward and outward breath, so that's the red line there. If you just look at the amplitudinal variation of that, it's about six uh, parts per million. So we've got six parts per million from the summer to the winter levels in our northern hemisphere, in our, our atmosphere, and then that trend line going up. The fact that the planet is able to sequester on an annual basis six ppm gave me the idea that we could potentially have a solution uh, in terms of photosynthetic pump down. So I'm going to talk a little bit about peat now, because I think peat is a really good option. So this is the kind of positivity um, for us. Globally, 3% of the world's um, surface is covered in peat. It's about 500 gigatons, which is almost the kind of total CO2 levels in the, uh, in, in the atmosphere. Twice as much as the carbon stored in, in our forest biomass, which is much more widely um, known about. In the IUCN, we call the peatlands the kind of Cinderella of the, uh, of the kind of terrestrial world in that nobody kind of no understands about it, but it's really very significant. Now, locally, in the UK, we've got 2.3 million hectares of blanket and raised bog, of which um, 80% or 1.8 uh, million hectares is degraded, so that's forming a, a source of carbon, not just a sink. So we're looking at, at peatlands for a potential long-term sink for carbon, but we've got problems in terms of the uh, actual quality of our peatlands. Now, peatlands and peat growth occurs where the, the rate of plant growth outstrips the decomposition. And the main player in this is this beastie here, sphagnum. We've got about 26 species in the UK. It's the engineer of peat growth, and it only occurs where you've got a water table which is less than 20 centimetres from the, the surface. Under those anaerobic conditions, those highly reducing conditions, this is a very recalcitrant species. It tends its decomposition is very slow. So it's a potential option for us, and it covers our blanket bog areas. Now, this is a slide from, from northern England, and it shows what we've done um, to our peatlands. We've farmed our peatlands, we've drained our peatlands, we've got ditches in them, uh, many um, tens of thousands of kilometres of, of, of uh, ditches across the UK that lowers that water table and causes these peatlands, these upland areas, marginal agricultural areas, to switch from a, a um, sink to a source of carbon. Um, so the restoration uh, is very simple in this particular case in, to block up those ditches and cause an elevation of the water table so that you can get um, uh, carbon growth. This is some work we've done at, um, on plateau sites on Dartmoor where we've looked at the blue areas of the areas which are actively sequestering um, carbon. So this is, is colour absorption imagery. And we've looked on these plateau areas, which are the slower growing areas of peat, and we've looked and found about seven um, tonnes of carbon uh, CO2 equivalent per hectare per year um, with our research group. Down in the Valley Myers, where the growth is even quicker, we found 16.5 tonnes of carbon uh, equivalent per hectare per year in those um, areas there, uh, which is really si significant in this, um, in this Valley Myers area. So the take-home messages from this really rapid talk is that 
pump down of carbon could be really significant. We could be looking globally with the right environmental management of about 1 ppm per year. Um, photosynthetic fixation of, by plants is a really powerful, much more powerful and, and less uh, costly than some of the other options. Uh, peatlands in the UK represent our best option um, for sequestering carbon. The IUCN has got a target of 1 million hectares to be restored by 2020. More locally on Dartmoor, we could have six to 8,000 hectares of active mire vegetation restored. And uh, payment for ecosystem, ecosystem services for the farmers is the way forward. And just to leave you with one thought, really, all that we are, physically all that we are and all that we rely on is carbon. Ultimately, really what we need in the future is a carbon-based monetary system where we recognise the true value of carbon. Uh, thank you very much.